like the PSVR idea. Like the PSVR. Yeah. 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 The PSVR was really funny. That, that was really funny. Fiat Keys. Can we have more of us? Okay. That's how we can get it. Well, uh, let's Let's do this. Obviously, we're not going to lecture for the whole time here. In fact, this is a time where we can sort of have discussions about theory. And uh, Dan framed his session as uh, the reasons why you debate are ultimately the justifications uh, for theory. I want to frame it just a little bit differently. If you had to tell somebody else what policy debate is, what things would you include in telling them? What do you think is most essential for people to understand in order to understand policy theory. I'm not talking about like telling uh, like novices at your school how to debate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like somebody who really understands, let's say, argument, and you're going to describe policy debate to them. What's the key features of policy debate that you think somebody has to know? Do you all call it policy debate where you're from? Or is it some place called CX debate? Oh, Either or. They call it that. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we should start with that. Uh, so the first question would be, describe what policy debate is, and the second question, describe what CX debate is. Or do, do you think those are the same thing? They're definitely not the same thing. Really? 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 No way. I mean... Let's start with policy debate. Okay. So you're talking to somebody, and it, don't imagine it's a novice, because too often we think that novice debaters are, are uh, not so bright. Okay, come on, give it up. You know, that you think like they just don't understand the way the world works. But imagine you're talking to somebody who really understands arguments, Okay, but they are not doing policy debate. So what's the first things that you would tell them that they have to understand in order to be understand, understanding of the way policy debate works? They understand argument. Okay? They understand refutation, clash, all that stuff. They got it. Go. What, what do you think is important for understanding policy debate? Extinction. <laughs> Nuclear war. That's the most important thing? It's one of the most important What is the resolution? The topic in which everyone debates on. set of uh, debates here last week where the most common topic was about whether or not Obama or Romney was going to win the election. Probably 85-90% of the debate talked about that. The other 10% was about whether or not we had unemployment. This is the resolution the focus of the debate? It's the starting point. Starting point? It's the general idea of the debate. The general idea? Yeah, it becomes the focus as the debate goes on, I guess. It becomes the focus as the debate goes on. So it's not the focus at the beginning, but it evolves it's into the focus? It's the general idea of, like, I consider the resolution to be a problem within the status quo, and I consider a plan to be that solution to the problem of the status quo. That's how I explain it. Th that's an interesting explanation. Uh, okay, so the first thing you think somebody has to know in order to understand, understand policy debate is, you have to understand there's a resolution. And even though it's stated as a resolution, do you have to agree with the resolution? Uh, no. No. So what's the purpose of the affirmative if they don't have to agree with the resolution? So they have to run a plan to meet the resolution. They have to run a plan to meet the resolution? What do you mean meet the resolution? They have to what? They have to affirm the resolution. Yes, they, have, they have to better our society. They have to better our society? That's a huge burden. Seriously? Yeah. What if, you do, if you avert nuclear war, that's, that's it. That's better in our society. What if the resolution is resolved, we should worsen society? We should what in society? <laughs> well, then you'll find it. Worsen. Can we find a plan to? Follow the resolution. To follow the resolution. Fine. That's the burden of the affirmative? No. Yes, to change the status quo. <laughs> to change the status quo. In any way? Well, it's yeah, one of the resolutions to be how to be the society, I guess, then, yeah. Pretty broad. Are, there, are there no limits on how they should change the status quo? Does the affirmative always have to change the status quo? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. What if the resolution is resolved? We should keep things exactly the same. And then we don't have to change the status quo, and the negative becomes. Do what? The affirmative becomes the status quo, and the negative. Well, actually, then the affirmative do a plan that keeps the status quo the same. Right. And the negative would argue why that plan would not keep the status quo the same. That's right. That's right. You need some situation where it changes the constant, and the affirmative would adopt what stay the same instead of having change. So, for example, resolved, once we set Billboard's number one top hit, it should always be that number one top hit. Because it changes weekly, right? That's what they tell me. 
Can't yes. follow music. Leslie says it changes way by. So, uh, I'm still confused on what the purpose of the resolution is. I'm sorry. By the way, uh, what Anshu said and Victoria, is that right? Mm -hmm. What Victoria and Anshu said, and it's lovely because you're at diametrically opposed corners of the room, are exactly the opposite. I didn't pay attention to what he said. Oh, that's oh. unfortunate because he basically said that uh, your idea was not a very good one. <laughs> no, he did not. Well, he said he implied that, so... Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, oh. Do you remember what you said about the resolution and its purpose? Uh, no. Let me go more? If you didn't remember, it wasn't important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you're right. Sorry. What? I don't remember what I said. You don't remember? Well, what do you think the resolution is for? Um, Take on the second, and I'll tell you whether you disagree or agree with yourself. Okay. Uh, like, what the debate should focus around? Do what? Isn't that kind of similar to mine anyway? So Wasn't that the plan of the focus of the debate? Well, we have three different pieces of resolution that have all been articulated. But I guess the question is, can you identify those three different views? Number four, which might be the same, or might not. Do what? Number okay, four, also which four? might not be the same. Uh, okay. the, the resolution is a statement which has to be affirmed by the affirmative and negated by the Okay, so the purpose of the debate is to affirm the resolution. That's On one the view. We've definitely heard varying strains of that for sure. Okay? Can you do a second one or a third one? Victoria, mm -hmm. Ali, come on. Alex was like. We're just asking you to resummarize the conversation so far. Oh, Right. Uh, the plan focus versus resolution focus is a key question. It goes back to what you see the purpose of the affirmative team in the debate for. So there's one view that we can probably all articulate that the purpose is to affirm the resolution, and thus the affirmative needs to defend that that's a good idea for some reason. And uh, basically, there, there were various attempts to defend that. And I was pushing uh, hard, actually, and we had a terrible idea of what that means for the for the debate. The second view that we heard for sure was the resolution provides a starting point to the debate. Yeah. Um, the affirmative doesn't necessarily have to affirm the resolution. They just have to affirm like a portion of it, right? A portion of it? Yeah. So so that's, that's like what a plan is. The plan that is in the resolution. So, so. Victoria says that would be non tactical. Well, I mean, debates change a lot. Some people just stand up and say debate's bad and do some kind of performance now. So it all really depends on the way. Well, yeah, but they're saying debate's bad, so you're saying that they're not topical, it's just kind of not a response there. Are they? You have to prove why them not being topical is bad, and their entire performance is a response to it. They're legitimately not topical. Well, actually, actually, the evolution of these arguments follows very close to our particular conversation. Like, we're basically throwing out the idea the affirmative has to affirm the resolution, and the purpose of the debate is to test the resolution for its truth or falsity. And it seems like a lot of people have sort of a gut feeling like, that's not cool, I'm not down with that, I'm not really into that form of debate. Am I right? Yeah. Silence <laughs> across the room. This is a view of debate that was uh, evinced uh, actually in the early 1980s under the, uh, under the, the nomenclature hypothesis testing that the resolution serves something like a scientific hypothesis. And the purpose of the debate is to provide some testing of that hypothesis to determine its truth or falsity. This is an idea that is not so popular right now. Either. Definitely not. I know somebody that read that as a framework argument. Sure, absolutely. You need to know the way these arguments are attached. Not necessarily so you can become like the most masterful theory debater and win a whole bunch of debates on theory, but so if somebody asks you these basic questions, you're able to connect the dots on these particular things. If you didn't, if you didn't realize at first that when you said the purpose of the resolution is to provide something that the affirmative needs to affirm, and they're supposed to do that as their burden, you were evincing the paradigm of hypothesis testing. So you need to realize those two are, are really intimately attached. This idea of hypothesis testing it got widely rejected by most people. Well, there are some folks out there, right? Still sort of all that, although they're in the minority, but I don't know that that should matter. Maybe if it was a good idea, even if the number of people that supported it are in a minority, it's still a good idea. But the, the evolution of thought was 
that the resolution provides a starting point for an affirmative. And as uh, as some people have said, the resolution provides something that if the affirmative is an example of that resolution, then uh, they can be topical and we're not really trying to prove the resolution. That's what David said, right? That's what you said? Interestingly enough, if the resolution is just a starting point for the debate, which is a very commonly held assumption, then performance affirmatives that actually begin by criticizing the resolution, they fulfill that obligation. So the argument for performance affirmatives being, uh, they don't say topical, they say related to the topic, is that they begin with the resolution and then criticize the resolution itself. Something like, uh, I don't know, have you got any of these in the camp this summer? On this transportation topic? I have a genealogy the KY. Genealogy? Is that we should interrogate transportation genealogy? It doesn't criticize transportation. We describe it as in the direction of the resolution because we're conducting a genealogy of race issues in, in the context of transportation. Uh -huh. Well, now it's race issues. Now we have about race issues. Oh, did that change? Well, it's about whiteness. And all around it was like, it's about discrimination of minorities. That includes women. That includes women. So in just that first question of, uh, I asked, like, what do people need to know to understand policy debate? You said, you got to understand the resolution. I asked you, what did that mean? You evinced uh, three different paradigms of understanding the world of debate. Is there anything else that somebody needs to know in order to understand policy debate? You just got number one, resolution. What else do you need to know? Did it? Partners. Partners? Like there are partners. Like marriage? Two. <laughs> yeah, marriage. People get married all the time. You've got to understand in that. In debate rounds. <laughs> in debate rounds? Really? <laughs> say like CX debate and then LB debate. And I'm like, wait, because they have cross-examination in Lincoln Douglas debate. Let me ask you a question. How old do you think policy debate is? How old do you think? Um, I'll say about 40 or 50. 40 or 50. Oh, wait, no. Policy debate or policy debating? Debate. Policy debate. Oh. Debating is thousands of years old. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't want to be extremely old. Tagger some after 41 BC. I'm going with like, the father of I'll say 50 to 75. 50 to 75? 106 years old. 106, that's very precise. I like it. 106. It's actually 107. <laughs> uh, do all of you do uh, debate with uh, NFL? Do you get NFL points and stuff? You do, whether you know it or not. The National Forensic League. Do you have any idea of when the National Forensic League was formed? Uh, Google. What? <laughs> Earlier than the 60s. The 50s? Earlier than the 50s? 30s. Here we go. No, crazy! <laughs> crazy, right? That is crazy. Uh, did you get it yet? Uh, 1925. 1925. 1925, birth of the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know when cross-examination was introduced? 
you sent a team today? That's going to be much harder for you to Google, so go for it. The same year? No. No, I've got something on that. I'll go to the 50s. What? The 50s? Nope. The 50s have been around since like the 40s, like the late 40s. The National Debate Tournament for college? Yeah. It was founded in 1947. Yeah, the Parkway Debate is probably in the early 40s. There are. I agree with you. I think that uh, by the late 30s and the early 40s, there's something that you can distinguishably call a policy debate because there's a resolution that is debated all year long. Mm -hmm. And uh, those resolutions, uh, they suggest evidence comparison and things that we would normally recognize. Do they have cross-examination is the question. I mean, like, policy debate. Uh -huh. Policy debate. Like, uh -huh. I feel like it's more accurately referred to as that. Cross-examination was not introduced until the 1970s. It was like 30 years of policy debate with no cross-examination. So is cross-examination something that's necessary or to use some debate lingo intrinsic to policy debate? Yeah, I've read some talk about this, so they can call it CF. So Do what? Can, like, put it on the posting, it's like CF. Yeah. Well, interestingly, there was like a format war in the early 70s. And you can actually trace uh, one particular college professor at the University of Oregon who suggested that we should have periods where students ask each other questions directly. And the, it used to be, before it was called cross ex debate, it was actually called Oregon style debate. Oregon really style. interesting. Oregon style. For like the previous sort of like 40 what? years before the 70s, it was called Oregon style debate? No, 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 no. no. This is in the early 70s, maybe oh. in the late 60s. Okay. But like, in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, there was debate uh, without cross-examination for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it was still very competitive, though, right? Huh? It was still very competitive. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. CETA was founded in 1971. Yeah. You are excellent at Google. I mean, you knock the hell out of Google. So what, what else do you have to know? Like you said, resolution, I'm with you on that. You said teams are necessary for policy debate. I said, nope, teams have in other forms of debate. You said cross-ex. I said, nope, you had policy debate before cross-ex. So we, what? Do you need speech structure? Excuse me? Do you need speech structure? How do you mean that? Uh, like, it starts off with the one you see, the LR, or like in high school, that lasts for eight minutes. Uh -huh. Then you have the three minutes CX period, and uh -huh. the one in C, that's eight minutes, uh -huh. and then the CX, uh -huh. and the two AC, eight minutes, and the CX. Like really, you can't question the format. 
I've seen the format questions. A what? I've seen the format questions okay. by, by like fifty K teams. Uh huh. Yeah. How did it go? How did they or, I mean yeah, they, I think they had broke the octo the first thing and lost like mm -hmm. it was like in their triples round they were running this like invade the public sphere off. It was like uh -huh. um what is it called? Occupy? Yeah. And like after the guy's speech it's like, hey, like partner, are you ready to like give that speech to invade the public sphere? And then he gave like a whole another speech into the other cross. Maybe I'm wrong. And the judge, the judge didn't say anything. <laughs> I mean, like there's versions like John 23 that kind of, kind of like, debate. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, one of my one of my teammates did. And, uh huh. So maybe that is in bounds also. I know that I've heard stories of people stealing ballots. From judges? Sure. Yeah, sure. The ballot's out of bounds? Or is that a theory argument? Keep one try to go shop on the ballot. That wouldn't be debate, that would be stealing ballots from judges. Yeah. Like, not, I'm not that's gonna not look at um, Like it's just not. not. There's no argument in it. It's just like immaturity. <laughs> 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 boundaries are made as you go, but at the same time, there's something that you have to be persuasive enough to make everyone else believe that it needs to be there. And certain things aren't easy to persuade. Uh -huh. I bet if you had a good enough speech about how a 3 and R is the only way you can truly make the round educational, everybody would be like, reset your timers, give them this 3 and R. It's, all, it all, it's all about how you talk. Do you all agree with Ali? I don't think that ever ends because the app would be like, oh no, they have this speech and they want this speech and then the judge would just never go um, on. Someone, someone actually told me a story about this dude who was like, really like, I don't know, out there. Like, and if you give a speech that you wanted three and uh, three and R, then he like, and you actually persuaded him, he would let you do it. Like, there was this one judge that was like kind of open-minded with debate. And like he was the type of person that was like, if he heard you give a speech that you should have a three and R, he would give it to you. Okay. He would let you do your three and R. Okay. I don't know. I'm just saying because it seems like you, you're just saying that everything is basically strict, and it's like she was kind of disagreeing with me, so I'm like just trying to like say that it's not necessarily wrong. I mean, yeah, it has been exceptions. Can you go the other way? Can you make theory arguments as to why the other team shouldn't have certain speeches? Like, so far, we've been doing add-ons, but can you also yeah, sure. sever? Three arguments about like off side bias or neg side bias, like the neg is the block, but the off has for a long speech. But and the impact of those is uh, you shouldn't get your speech. Some people try to be crazy for it. Does that work? I mean, I'm not really. Also, something crazy then critical. I couldn't imagine how it would work. I mean, if they try to cut out your next speech, you can't really respond to the argument anyway. So. Uh -huh. And I don't think the judge is going to stand up and say, nope, you don't get your speech, sit back down, it's their turn again. Well, that's what I'll be interested in. That would be hilarious, though. Well, what if someone just came up and tried to give a 3 and R, and they'd be like, sit back down? They would want to do Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so all of this, it seems like we're saying the format is not something that defines policy, right? Yeah. No. Because all of these things relate to the format can be changed, the format can be shifted, so it's maybe not, it's not something that. It's not that it can't be changed right away, it just, take, it just takes time for it to be changed. Okay, but it's not a defining feature yeah. of policy. For now, so it is. So still you've got the resolution. There is, there is the, uh, at least the general guidelines that are formed by the Tournament. It, it's uh, because I mean. How can I get elected to this government? 
<laughs> and do they pay? No. <laughs> because if the guidelines for that specific tournament are you have uh, you know eight three five. Yeah. Then the people who are actually giving those speeches mm -hmm. in that context can attempt to do something, but as long as long as the official rules don't change, then uh, they can still do it if they want to, I guess, but it doesn't change the essence of that in every other debate that will go on later. Right, right. right. That will still be the starting point. Oh, I see. So the, even though there are individual variations, you're saying overall format is still something that uh, is unique to policy debate? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm trying to help. I'm not sure. The format will still be at least attempted to be defined for each round by whichever organization. I mean, it's quite possible that after a while, if all debaters start doing something, then okay. they'll say, okay, go ahead. We'll That's fair. Change the format. Not, I mean, not to be, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, we have the same topic all year. I don't think any other country does that. Mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're shifting, right? You're, oh. uh, you're making a shift from the format to yeah. resolution states to focus all year. Yeah. Is that a defined feature of policy today? I can't think of it. I don't want to have a I think delivery style is pretty, pretty big delivery because delivery style. normally, so it's normally in things like LD and PF, it's a little slower. It's like LD is supposed to be more about ethics and PF is more about pros and cons, but CX is more. Typically, the community is embracing a heavy evidence, mm -hmm. rapid delivery, kind of. Some people think that we should role play the ZSFG, other people are taking more critical stands. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so, the, uh, the style of delivery that is unique to policy debate is a defining feature of it. Yeah. And that style of feature you're saying is rapid fire debate, is that correct? could not have a slow policy today. You could, yeah. but typically. It's it depends on your region. Spreading, I think, uh, began around 1950s or 60s. Yeah, yeah, much later. Much later. Much later. Yeah. Much later. Yeah. So it, it wasn't always intrinsic to the it, well, it is a feature now. It is, it is. If you look at most, what we consider competitive debates, TOC debates, mm -hmm. champions of NFL, well not NFL, because NFL is supposed to be slow, but like TOC, which we like hold as the prestigious debate, mm -hmm. and like people at the NDT, it's like typically rapid fire debate, evidence based, like, super big and the, I mean, faster is better, it's a thing that the community is embracing now. It seems as though that kind of debate is only pertaining to experienced judges. What about parent judges? The way we debate from parent judges, that's still part of the debate. Did you say a pair of judges? Parents. Parents. Parent judges. Lay. I thought you were back on the marriage thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so that's a, the, the style is a reflection of a particular judging community. Is that what you're saying? I guess so. Okay. And uh, thus. But yeah, that's, that's the same for like Popo and LGBT. Right, right. I, I thought that's what you were saying, that, that every form of debate tries to adapt to its particular judging community, and thus while styles change, actually the style is the same, and that the style is adapted to what each different community considers an expert community of judges. Is that what you're saying? That's a really good point. Nice. Yeah. I think there are some 
Which change? Well, uh, the only defining feature I can think of is the fact that we have to, well, is that U.S. federal government is a key aspect of policy debate as opposed to the other types of debate in which they use different things, like use governmental aspects, yet they use moral and, uh, what is PF again? Pro-con. Yeah, pro-con. Yeah. So we say that the government's, what our base of learning is going to come off of, LD says that yeah. right or wrong, so on and so forth. Well, right. Chaos don't use the government most times. They but I mean, like, they still make it as though this is why we don't need to use the government. This right. is why we shouldn't use the government. This is why we hate using the government. They're often criticisms of the government. So they make sure their view is still using the government, even though they're saying they're not using the government. Uh-huh. I mean, just because Kayla, um, you can uh, <laughs> criticize, <Not a> trial. <laughs> criticize the question and say that there is no true essence of debate. And, you know, you can genealogize uh, debate as much as you want to, but you can never really yeah. pin down <laughs> an essentialist yeah. type of definition of your policy debate. Yeah. Okay. You don't literally mean the USFG, right? Because uh, obviously there's there's policy made in Japan, but they made the Japanese. I mean, like, but you mean government yeah. entities. Yeah. But sometimes for uh, world's format and British parliamentary format, they suggest governmental action. In fact, m uh, most of the time, actually, on the motions that they make. So, but still, there's something different, probably. But can we isolate that difference? Yeah. I'm just wondering. Like, you know how, like, some policy, well, I guess you can't call it policy debaters, but some K debaters in policy debate would be like, F debate, and just coming around and be like, we should reject everything ever? Yeah. Can you really do that with any other form of debate? Can you just go in LD and be like, F LD, we should do everything opposite? Hmm. And can you really go in public forum and be like, F this, and then, like, yeah, wait yeah, off of that? So then why does it happen in policy debate if it's not allowed to happen in public forum or have to, like, happen in maybe, maybe not happen in LD? That's what I'm wondering. It just happens in policy debate. That's critical. Maybe that's something that's interesting to call it. Is that something? Yeah, is that? Oh. I'm thinking. So I guess you can say mm -hmm. what makes us intrinsic, intrinsic is our freedom. Do what? What makes us intrinsic, or whatever the word is, because I'm not a word person, to be honest with you, is our amount of freedom in our different ways of debating and learning about the debate. Well, just, uh, maybe, yeah. Um, I'm not totally sure the bounds of that. I'm not sure the limits of that. But it does seem like the one unusual thing, uh, which is kind of what I was trying to get to, is um, policy debate has a debate about theory. And other forms of debate don't have that, actually. I'm not aware that the theory type lab, none of us said that. That is awkwardly simple. It's unusual because uh, that has been a feature of policy debate. In fact, the idea that there are theoretical limits which are argued inside of a debate, that is actually one of the most structural features. Like, how old do you think counter plans are? Not that old, probably, I guess. The feathered star. Incredibly old. Oh, 1930s. People were debating counterplans. And you know what the number one objection to a counterplan was in the 1930s? This is obviously a terrible argument. They have no other strategy than to suggest change. It was a theoretical objection. That's, that's basically no day fiat or something like that. It's stated very differently than we would understand it because it's appealing to a different judge base. But the idea that there are things that can be questioned within the bounds of what's an acceptable argument and what's not acceptable argument, that, for some reason, is a structural feature that formulates policy debate. So we've always had that as sort of an issue. It's always been something that is decided within the bounds of the topics. And there have been like all kinds of missteps, like all kinds of um, theory disasters. <laughs> <laughs> like people suggested this idea, and at first everyone was like, I don't know how to respond to that, thus I lose. <laughs> and that happened for a while until someone came along and said, that is really stupid, thus you lose. And uh, those kind of things happen, like this uh, idea, the, the, the importance of the resolutional focus is it spawned an idea called uh, counter warrants. Do you know about counter warrants? You need to know about like the history of debate to know like all those missteps and things. So counter warrants were arguments that somebody said, well, you know what, if the purpose of the debate is to prove the resolution, like we, then all 
negative needs to do is disprove the resolution. So if the negative runs a tax against the resolution, even if they don't apply to the affirmative, those can result in a negative ballot. And that idea like carried weight for a while until somebody said, no, that's really not the point of the debate. The point of the debate is to have some sort of interpretation for things. Some sort of interpretation for... Sounds like framework. Hmm? Sounds like framework. Yeah, uh, one view of, uh, of theory, one view of uh, debate theory is everything comes down to framework. Framework is both the starting and the end point for all theoretical arguments. So now that I've uh, given that statement, that bold claim, uh, do you agree or disagree, and can you defend or explain or unpack that statement? That all theory discussions begin and end with framework. I agree. What sort of framework? What? What sort of framework? What does framework mean? I really enjoyed uh, Dan's lecture. I thought there was lots of stuff, and it gave us lots of fuel to discuss tonight and tomorrow afternoon. But the one thing I thought was missing in his list of like problems in the bid, he listed many like conditionality and fiat and all those sort of things. The one missing was what is the role of the framework? And that might be a really crucial deciding issue. And it, it, I think um, like generations go through areas where they're trying to figure things out on debate theory, and like framework is really contentious right now. There's no, as uh, Dan said, a lot of these theory issues, there are judges that have certain feelings one way or another, like you can, uh, on an international topic at least, you can go through the judging philosophies and you can figure out who is in favor of international fiat and who's not. If they don't mention it all, at all, you're probably okay. If judging philosophy says, I don't believe in international fiat, that's immediately uh, a voting issue. However, there are much fewer judging philosophies that identify what the salient issues on framework are. Because people are still sort of figuring it out. They literally might change their minds from round to round. So the issue of how the judge goes about deciding things, that sort of meta issue, may be itself up for grabs much more than fiat. People seem to have well-defined ideas of fiat. Do you have a well-defined idea of fiat for yourself? When Dan was going through this continuum of fiat, as he called it, did you see certain things that you said, okay, yeah, I agree with that, or no, I don't agree with that? No? Show of hands. There was some point on this continuum that you said, yep, that's me. So most people, most people have that kind of thought. Because they sort of know what they think about fiat, know what you think about a lot of these issues. But uh, there are probably some issues that are still undecided if we, if we go through those. One of those, uh, one of those issues on fiat is uh, multiple world fiat, right? Now, I think that's actually the topic we're supposed to talk about tonight, isn't it? Tracy assigned us a topic to talk about. I mean, I know we're the all-stars. We can do what we want, right? We want to just have a home run derby. That's what we do. Because we're all-stars, right? Help me out. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> but it's probably worth asking, like, what is the deal with multiple worlds? Why is this such a controversial idea for me? When I frame the question like that. I mean, like, so people say reciprocity. The apple reciprocity. The apple is the one world. But then they can have worlds that, like, a Right. It's like the multiple worlds aspect yeah. is like one I hate because it said at least it says Neg can contradict itself, they can they can use whatever they want against you because there's multiple worlds. Oh no, we're we're critiquing ca um capitalism in here and we're saying that this um fiscal discipline is good in here uh -huh. and we're saying that um US federal government needs to stay good in here. Uh -huh. Yet it doesn't clash. 
but I can have my own world in which I have my second affirmative that has nothing to do with any of those at all because I have a communist government in my plan. Uh-huh. So there's no reason you can't do that. You can run two affirmatives. No, because the, when they say multiple worlds, they say that the neg gets multiple worlds. So if you run a second half, they say that's not coincide, that's not going inside right. there. Assuming that you don't have an economy advantage, couldn't you just DM the crap out of the economy one and just get away with that? That's good. Cool. We break down capitalism, we break down the system, that's good. Well, fine. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's how, that's how, how you plan. Yeah, yeah, that's how you deal with that because they contradict each other on yeah. a fundamental level. Then it's basically yeah. you just. Sounds like a good person. You can see one of the other disciplines and you say, I think it sounds like a good person. Uh, it's not a firm, is it? It's, I mean, you can think about it. Plan, I need to know what you think a uh, firm is then, which is a great topic. I'm sorry, I put that in. <laughs> no, 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 it's a great question. What is a, I assume that's short for permutation? A test of competition. A test of competition. Oh, shit. Did you Google that? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> is it a firm to say, concede fiscal depression causes war? That, what, what, how did it work? I'm sorry. Or whoever did it, I'm sorry. See the fiscal work. Fiscal discipline, which says that, that your app uh, is a spending that says that your app collapses the economy and then you right, like, yeah. we yeah. solved your con- we solved your cap case and advantage the Yeah, they, oh, they, have a a 13, they have thirteen minutes to answer D Dev and D Dev isn't exactly the strongest argument, so I wouldn't want to walk into a debate baking on the fact that we're just gonna end D Dev. It's a fun it. argument. Well uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to like uh, this is an interesting quandary. Uh, I'm not interested in if the 13 minutes of cards against d um, although that would be a great uh, debate for sure. That's a wonderful argument. Uh, D-development, it's incredible. Um, absolutely. You know, there, there's good work on both sides of that. Um, all, all of that kind of thing. But uh, what, if the, what if the negative stands up and says, well, the capitalism critique was a conditional advocacy. Yeah, you have to run the conditionality as bad to, you know, have that work out for you. Right. This begs the question of, should they be able to do that? I think uh, I think if you contradict yourself on some, such a fundamental level, it's probably not a good thing. Because you're because you're you're forcing the app to debate like like two things. Uh huh. So if you can test the app in multiple ways, it's funny. Well, yeah. If you can test it like, well, yeah, yeah, but if you're yeah. but if you're forced to read like, if you're forced to double through yourself, yeah, if like the yourself. Meg does something like that, then like say they have an objective as a critique and a cap okay? um, something like that, it's like it may it almost makes you double turn yourself. Jeremy, right? Yeah. Uh, and do I hear you correctly that you're basically saying? There are there's a hierarchy of contradictions. Yeah. Basically. Some contradictions are worse than others. Probably at some point. Yeah. Uh, how would one figure out the different levels of? I'd say it's more of the codes than it is a hierarchy. Okay. But um, I, I don't know. Just like some of them, would, uh, each situation, some of them would seem worse than others to me. Okay. It's just like if someone runs something that says capitalism is. 100% bad, uh-huh. and, uh, and in the same round, in the same speech, one was arguing that capitalism is 100% good, uh-huh. that, that just doesn't show very much quality of their argument. There's no investment in any sort of argument, and I don't think it Can would Can you describe it. the level of, of contradiction there? Like, like, an objective, I'm sorry, like an objectivism critique, which is like, you know, we need to reject taxes so we can have laws that create capitalism, and uh-huh. cascade is like we should embrace complete collectivism. Can I just push a little bit on that? You mind? Yeah. How about if you counterplan with states saying the state governments are better and you criticize governments? Is that the same level of contradiction in your mind? I don't think so, not so, not so much. You're advocating state action. Well, you, you're you're advocating yeah, you're, I mean, you're, you're advoca- if you advocate state action and you say the government's in totality is bad, uh-huh. it's, it's a contradiction, but it's more like you're making a meta level claim and then a, a more diverse claim almost. Uh-huh. Okay, I think there's kind of a difference between PrepCon and Multiple World. What's that, PrepCon? Pre- performative contradiction. Because What's that? Huh? What's it's that? like where you're speaking and you're contradicting yourself point blank. Uh-huh. And that's bad to debate because then it seems like all these arguments are bad to debate because you don't know what you're talking that's about. That's bad? Well, some people argue that. 
Okay. Um, but I think there's a difference between the two because I think multiple worlds would mean that even though you are contradicting yourself in a sense, it's where you imagine different worlds, like different things are happening, so you see what side the affirmative or negative is on. So if you run a so if you run a cat plan that says we're gonna have capitalism for the rest of our lives, and you run another cat plan that says we're not gonna have capitalism for the rest of our lives, depending on the way the affirmative answers it, and if they perm one of the cat plans, you see that they're on that side. Then you see what position the affirmative is in. So that's why I think it's kind of different from multiple worlds because it's like. Uh, it's just to see what position the affirmative is, whereas PrepCon is just there because they want to have fun and it's more like... Trevor, were you saying performative contradictions? I was more... Yeah, my, my argument was more about... That them. was your distinction for what contradictions are bad? Basically. The ones that are performative? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's basically what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. Multiple worlds uh, to the point that you make a performative contradiction are probably bad. Mm -hmm. it, it, I guess that's And I think that could be good when you try to understand what side the app is on, because every affirmative can shift the every app. Like, I mean, basically one of the guys said it, like, yesterday, I believe it was yesterday? Yeah, like, the lectures and all the speeches and whatever. You want the app to be big because you want to shift it depending on the debate round, so you want the debate round. So, one year the world would be good if you want to find out what position the app is in, because every app just wants to be flexible depending on whether or not they want to balance. Fair. Well, but you could also just run an argument that has a very, very specific link to like, like, there's an argument that uh, there was this moon treaty app last year, and they would shift between solving capitalism and, per and, and uh, continuing capitalism. And so you'd have to wait, wait until like, some sort of capitalist uh, meta ethic. I'm not that. sure what about your original example of uh, capitalism and fiscal discipline was actually a performance contradiction. I understand exactly what you're talking about, and the lineage of performance contradiction comes from post-colonial scholarship on feminism and the idea of strategic essentialism, the need to highlight the superiority of women strategically in order to advance the causes of feminism. Yeah. That kind of performative contradiction where you are criticizing the discourse while utilizing the discourse was very much discussed as a philosophical endeavor. I don't, I, uh, am I wrong? I don't understand why critique of capitalism and spinning this ad is a performative contradiction. Well, Can you help me out on that? Oh, I was, I, I, I kind of shifted over to objectivism because the, objectivism? the, the, the base, the base. So the rights are bad? What? Taxes are bad? Is that what it was? Yeah, like? yeah, like, like taxes are bad because we need to engage in completely laissez fair capitalism. And what's the dissent? Uh, the dissent just says that it, it implies that capitalism is good by saying that you're going to crash the economy and saying that's bad. And that's especially, that's especially bad if they read like capitalism. They read the link to the cat. Always cat. Why is that? I don't know. I just don't feel. I feel like it, it contradicts itself. Do you remember how I said the history of theory debate is somebody says, I have something you've never heard of. You have no answer to it, thus I win. Like, let's not fall into that trap with the you know, performance contradiction. Can I get a, 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 a more thorough. What, what you're talking about with performance contradiction, I don't want it to become a term that we use for critique conditionality. Right? Like that would be that would be or the same you, as I know this term, you don't know it, therefore I win. Well, that, that's not what I'm trying to say. I understand don't. completely. I, I just want to know how it works in this thing. I'm not trying to criticize anything. Okay. Help me understand the objective. Well I personally no. never actually run a perform performance contradiction argument, so yeah. I may slightly misunderstand the, the, what a, the, the claim of the theory argument actually is. But Many times it has to do with criticizing the discourse. Yeah. Because that's a part of it. I just jump right in. Like jump honestly. Right in. On the whole, it was capitalism and uh, spending that was supposed to be a question. Well, no, he changed it to objectivism and spending. Well, I mean, like, I'm not going to be, I'm not that critically smart, so I'm going to just turn it back one. Do you understand libertarian politics? Because there's somebody running for the presidential ticket that's a libertarian. Right? On Paul. You don't have to be that far out to understand the idea that taxing people is an infringement of their rights, economic rights. Right? Yeah. And I think that's the argument you're making right here. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, like, well, I'm trying to reverse it back one for us because the whole capitalism argument is saying that capitalism in itself is what will cause our end and it will lead to us all dying. Yeah. And the spending arguments say that if you ruin our economy and if you don't invest in our economy and keep our economy strong, then we'll all die. So it's basically saying, you know, it's basically saying, I think that we need to get away from capitalism because we'll die. Uh -huh. But if you mess up our economy, as in, you don't keep our economy strong, our capitalist economy strong, uh -huh. we'll all die. So you contradict yourself because you force yourself to say, no matter what you do, 
you're going to kill, hey, we're going to die. So if you act or not, we're going to die. If we do the plan or not, we're going to die. And that's kind of different because it forces the act to fight itself on two levels by saying, oh, we're going to keep the economy strong, but we're going to throw away our whole economy for communism. Yeah.
then you've already messed up the bait itself because we're not actually getting the pure education. You're actually just trying to fight for a win. And that in itself ruins the educational level of the bait. But uh, that could be, I think what we're trying to do is try and figure out what is the theoretical objection to these two positions. If you're right that the contradiction somehow impinges the affirmative, I want to know what the reason for that is. So let's come up with articulating the reasons why these contradictions are what they, and the education is an impact of fairness, is that true? So it has to be on balance worse for one side than the other. So why does it uniquely disadvantage the affirmative, I guess, is we've got to ask that question. Well, I mean like I don't want to be able to talk. It, it forces the affirmative to say that that um, that having a completely free market of some sort is bad, like like relegating the power of the state to the free market is bad, but also to answer uh, the cap K with uh, with some other argument. It, it, it might potentially have the debate with two completely contradictory arguments. Right? So the affirmative has to contradict themselves in order to answer the argument? They may have to, yes. Is that a reason that... Uh, Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the yeah, real be good for the okay. Then, then, then the 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 objection should be uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the objection should be just conditionality. Well, that's what I'm asking. The, the purpose of this question is, what is the reason that conditionality is bad? Oh, oh, okay. Uh -huh. all right, all right. So we may have gone about it and came in uh, ass backwards, but what is the reason conditionality is bad? And if you don't like these contradictions.
that's obviously a factor. But let me also point out that's not an issue in, in contradictory arguments, right? Yeah. That yeah. even counterclaims which do not contradict the rest of the negative strategy. The negative says solvency, state's counterplan, and politics. And we can all agree that's a coherent strategy, right? This thing's not contradictory. Your issue of moving target is still the case if that counterplan is conditional. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's not a reason that contradiction necessarily is bad. It's a reason why da 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 counterplan. Well, I thought, well, wouldn't it wouldn't be more of an argument as to why conditionality itself is bad. And, uh, maybe. And, condition, and if conditionality is bad, then you're forced to have to do a contradictory. Uh, it's an argument against any non conditional kind of plan. Okay. So it applies to conditionality and dispositionality, right? Uh, no. I don't, I don't think it would really apply to dispositionality that much. Why not? I, I don't know. I just feel like dispositionality would know me here for some reason. Okay. Fine. Fair. Can I ask the difference between conditional and dispositional counterclaims? Just to make sure we're all on the same target. It's yes. fair and What? It's fair and Dis Dispositionality is completely ambiguous depending on what they interpret it to be. It is? Yeah, like someone could think, like you, uh, that in the lecture today, today you used the example of they saw it as if you prove that we can't solve, yeah. that is a reason for us to kick the counterclaim. Some other people as, see it as if you put any defense on the counterclaim, yeah. that's the reason we can kick the counterclaim. That would include permutations. Uh -huh. um, other people, I don't know, it just would depend on the person. That's why dispositionality is. To be fair, the, Dan said the origin story of dispositionality. Yeah, right. Story. I think there is a generally uh, accepted understanding of the term now. Uh, largely because of an article that Roger Soul wrote about the concept of limited conditionality. But uh, uh, I to that's totally fair if there's disagreement. So tell me, what is dispositionality then? Didn't you see it? Did he see it today? The one it was? Do what? Straight term No, he said the origin of dispositionality was the status of the counterplan depends on whether or not it solves. And, and actually, uh, most people, that was one of those things. I mean, seriously, that is exactly what I said. That he told the story of how this happened in one round, and what happened in that round literally was, we used a word that you don't know, so you lose, and then over time, people were like, wait, that's dumb. <laughs> but now there is a concept of dispositionality related to uh, really a piece of writing by Roger Soule on limited conditionality. Wait, doesn't he, conditionality. doesn't he hate what? dispositionality, though? Is he like, dispositionality is a really stupid idea because it can mean so many different things? Okay. So what does it mean? It means I'm pretty sure things. it's most of the time it's considered uh, that if you straight turn uh, the argument, that if the affirmative straight turn the argument, the negative can't kick your counterpoint. The negative can't kick your counterpoint? They can't kick it if you straight turn the argument. Yeah. Or they put only offense on it, but I don't know if that, I think they can kick it if you put dispositionality bad on it, but I'm not sure. That's why I'm, I think it's ambiguous. I guess it would make sense if you couldn't kick it if they put dispo bad on it, because that's just something you would want to do anyway against the counterplan. Oh, yeah, right. The, the dispo <laughs> interpretation that theory counts as only argument. <laughs> Brilliant, <laughs> but <laughs> it shouldn't stay up to the test. <laughs> so, uh, and, and by the way, this is the key for uh, conditionality. Jeremy, I think that's what you were saying. Not necessarily that it's a moving target. And Ali, I think this is what you were trying to say when you said, we all die. We're just fucking dead, man. We're just all dead. The, the argument you're trying to make is that it's impossible for the firm to generate offense against the argument. Okay, that's different from time skew, stress skew, all the other skew, skew arama, skew bowling, all those things. <laughs> the inability to generate offense may be an argument we should assess with regard to conditionality. I took conditionality to be the idea that the negative can pick and choose counterpoints based on their own desirability, based on what the negative says, we want to defend or what we don't want to defend, which would prevent the affirmative in each one of these cases from running disadvantages to the counter plan, right? So they have an inability to generate offense against those things. So then tell me what dispositionality is along with this. Oh, well, I have something separate to say, but I think okay. that that would also answer back the times here whenever we just run disads. You can turn those disads, and you can't kick the disads because they're turned, unless you're going to spend a lot of time answering back all of the turns on them or the offense on them. Like, if you straight turn a disad, they can't just kick it. But if you straight turn...